the moderator of our panel uh, is uh, David Waluka. David is a real, has been a realtor since 1976 and in 2006 was the president of the Massachusetts Association of Realtors. He's the president of his own company, Waluka Real Estate uh, Corporation, a residential and commercial real estate marketing and consulting uh, firm located in Sharon. David is, uh, has nearly 40 years of experience uh, in the fields of real estate sales, development, zoning, and land use. He has been appointed Mars Focus Area Vice President for Government Affairs uh, in 2000, and he served in that position through 2004. Uh, he also served as the chair of uh, the National Association of Realtors Smart Growth Program and Advisory Group. For the past five years, David has been a represent re represented realtors on numerous task forces, working groups, reviewing real estate zoning laws. David's tireless work in government affairs arena on behalf of the profession has been truly extraordinary. And for his service, David was honored being the second recipient of Mars Public Policy and Property Rights Advocacy Award, which he was presented to him just this past June uh, 2011. David, it is an honor to turn this panel over to you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's an honor to be part of what I hope will be a very powerful uh, meeting today that will lead to results that will change uh, the direction in which, uh, unhappily, I think we're going. Uh, I want to take a minute to, because I have the microphone and you don't, uh, <laughs> to make a comment on the last session. Uh, I think that both of the mayors were quite powerful in what they had to say, particularly with relationship to the, value, the intrinsic value of home ownership. And they talked about the incentives of, uh, that the cities gave to people, the tax incentives and so forth. And I, remember, I thought back to the Homestead Act, not the one that lets you protect your assets, but the one where the government said, if you can get out there, you get 40 acres, right? There was a intrinsic value to the nation to be a nation of homeowners. Then there still is. And, and when you look at things like a year ago's Time magazine that uh, frankly became fish news pretty quickly, but the culture of it, home ownership is being questioned. Why do we need to be a, na a nation of homeowners? Isn't it okay to be a nation of renters? And uh, you're going to hear some of that uh, in the conversations from uh, both uh, Dr. Bluestone and from uh, uh, Dr. Belsky. Uh, also, there was a mention of the uh, SCOPE program uh, from Baltimore, and uh, both uh, Mayor Langs and Mayor O'Brien uh, have been involved. Mayor Lang himself testified when uh, uh, MAR uh, produced legislation for it last year, and the, the town manager in uh, uh, Worcester, uh, whom uh, we met with, our local association met with last year, was also uh, in favor, strongly in favor of it, in principle, with the same caveats that they had. Uh, to bring you an update, uh, we have been told by the Inspector General that we probably don't need legislation, which would be great. And uh, the State Association is working with the IG's office as we speak to create a protocol for the cities to be able to engage real estate professionals to qualify and market uh, city-owned properties efficiently. Uh, the first year in Baltimore, the city netted $3 million and several hundred properties came back onto the market. Uh, most recently, it's, that's doubled uh, in terms of the annual revenue to the city. And it's the old Jane Jacobs uh, concept. You fix up one or two houses and the rest of the street comes back. So uh, I'm looking forward in, in having uh, our uh, almost 20,000 members uh, across the state work with their local cities and towns in trying to bring those kinds of properties back into play. Uh, the uh, title of this is The Relationship Between Home Ownership, Jobs, and Economic Growth. And there is absolutely uh, a nexus uh, between them all. And one that I just said a few moments ago is, is under attack, uh, particularly at the, at the federal policy level. Uh, this panel will discuss how housing, real estate, and home ownership relate to employment and economic growth in Massachusetts. Uh, the issues of surplus housing inventories and their impact on property values and the perception of home ownership as an economically desirable endeavor. Uh, we'll ask them what their perceptions are and uh, for the eco economic future of home ownership. Uh, I think with that, I think we want to get going for the, for the sake of time. We have with us um, Professor Barry Bluestone. 
Uh, he is the Stearns Trustee Professor of Political Economy and the founding director of the Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy and the Dean of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University. Uh, this goes on for several pages in all deference to Barry. Uh, uh, he is among the champions uh, of housing uh, and, and housing as in its role in economic development, not just in the Commonwealth, but across the nation. We also have Dr. Eric Belsky from the Harvard Joint Center on Housing. Uh, he's Managing Director of the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard and a lecturer in Urban Planning and Design at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, the school itself was a collaborative venture of the Graduate School of Design and the uh, John F. Kennedy School of Government. Uh, the center conducts research on the nation's most critical housing and urban issues, and prior to his Harvard appointments, Dr. Belsky led the Housing Finance and Credit Analysis Group at Price Waterhouse. And that is a perspective I really want to see, hear something about. Um, He's also held the positions of Director of Housing Finance Research at Fannie Mae, Senior Economist at the National Association of Home Builders, and Assistant Professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, he has extensive experience conducting research on housing markets, housing finance, and housing policy. He has published numerous articles in trade publications and academic journals, so I ask you to welcome both Dr. Bluestone and Dr. Belsky. And Barry, you're on. Is my mic on? Can you hear me? Is the button green? Uh, is my button green? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't checked. <laughs> the red do? <laughs> I'm going to need that. Big oh, it's working fine. Red works. OK. I'm going to come down with you, because I want to watch my slides. And I want you to watch these. What I've done, I, I'm a card-carrying economist. Um, so I do this for a living. Uh, I have a PhD in economics, as some of you know, uh, that stands for piled higher and deeper. And what I've done is I've put together a set of slides for you here, uh, and for MAR and for mass housing, to give you the background on where the economy is now and the link between housing and, and, um, and the economy. Now I should say this is a preview of coming attractions because our center, the Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy, puts out, as many of you know, our annual Greater Boston Housing Report Card. And that will be out uh, on October 25th, just a few days from now. And so this is, gives you a little preview of attractions of a small part of that overall report. Uh, so let's get into it. Here is what the economy looks like going back to 2004, looking at changes in real gross domestic product. This is the national economy. And you'll see where we got into that very deep recession beginning in December 2007. And in fact, by the uh, fourth quarter of 2008, GDP was declining by 9% on an annual rate, 8.9%. One of the deepest, deepest recessions we've ever had. And then we saw a wonderful recovery. We began to see a wonderful recovery. Uh, we, got, we broke into uh, positive uh, growth. And in fact, we were up at about 3.9, almost 4%. To give you an idea, 4% growth rate was what we had during the booming 1960s when family income was doubling in a single generation. And then it stalled out. And by the first quarter of this year, January, February, March, we were down to only 4 tenths of 1% growth. And in the second quarter, about 1%. We'll have some new numbers coming out for the third quarter fairly soon. And we'll have to see what that looks like. Most economists are now re re redesigning their forecasting models, coming up with new forecasts, and they're all going down from what we would have seen. Uh, Goldman Sachs, others are now suggesting that for all of 2011, we'll have a growth rate of about 1.5%. If we're lucky, we'll get up to 2% in 2012. We need between 2.5% and 3% growth on an annual basis to bring unemployment down. Not surprisingly, the Congressional Budget Office, in a report that most people have not looked at, suggests we will not get back to full employment in the United States, which they define as 6% unemployment. That's how they define full employment. It's 6% unemployment. We're 9-1 right now. We will not get there until 2017. That's what we're facing. In Massachusetts, we're doing a little bit better. The red bars here are the nation. The blue bars are Massachusetts. And for those last two quarters, those are projections by Mass Benchmarks by my colleague, Alan Clayton Matthews, who's on my staff at Northeastern University. We have been doing much better. 
I know the lieutenant governor isn't here uh, yet, but uh, he will be happy to know that in our report next week, or on the 25th, we're going to note that Massachusetts, since December 2007, has had the best recovery in our economic activity of any state save one. North Dakota does a little bit better than we do. They have a lot of oil. They have no people. And as a result, <laughs> um, we actually have had the second best recovery since the December 07 recovery, uh, recession. Of course, we can't be an island unto ourselves, and what happens nationally will affect us. Um, if we look at jobs, almost no growth in jobs since uh, the middle of uh, last year. Uh, we've just been stuck at about 139 million. We're still about 7 million below what we were at the peak in 2008. And if you look at the number of unemployed, the number of unemployed nationally is remaining the same. And what is scary about this unemployment is a very large number of those 14 million, about 6.5 million of those people, have been unemployed for six months or more. And there's a large proportion who have been unemployed for a year or more. When you're unemployed for a year or more, you're almost unemployable. That's what's scary about these numbers. So let's ask the question, why so deep, why so long? Why so deep, why so long? Well, one is confidence is shot in America. Consumer confidence and business confidence remain at historically low levels, leading to depressed consumption investment. You know this yourself. Over the course of just one month, July to August of this year, this summer, uh, the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index, I used to help do some of that when I was a graduate student uh, working on that index, fell from 63.7 to 54.9, the lowest level since 1980. That's 30 years ago, right? Now, it may be coming up a little bit. The stock market's been recovering a little bit. Uh, but still, we're suffering from very low confidence. And when you have very low confidence, you don't get much spending. And if you don't have much spending, you don't have the economy recover. Right? We also have a global financial crisis. Greece, Spain, Ireland. You hear about that all the time. The EC seems, the European uh, Common Market seems to be stabilizing these countries a little bit. They seem to have come to some solution to the debt crisis in Greece. But it's a continuing problem. And global economic chaos has riled, roiled stock markets. And it could ultimately compromise our export performance. And exports are an important part of our economy. China's currency manipulation, even though the dollar is weakening a little bit against the Chinese currency, which is good for our exports and means we'll get fewer imports, we still have a problem internationally. The other thing that is causing a problem, the profits are way up. Uh, but investment is down. Uh, right now, there's about $1.8 trillion worth of corporate profits sitting around. That's trillion, not billion, TR. $1.8 trillion, up 25% since 2008. Yet investment in non-residential investment is down by 11%. Essentially, corporations are sitting on a lot of profits. They're not rehiring workers, and they're not investing at the same rate they used to in non-residential investment, in plant and equipment. So if consumers aren't spending, and if businesses aren't spending, the economy can't recover. Right? Well, maybe government can help, but the problem is, is consumers aren't cons <coughs> consuming, as I said. Um, disposable income saving rates are actually at all-time highs, which would normally be good. We want people to save, but it's terrible during recessions when we want people to spend. Uh, when you're anxious about losing your job and your 401k isn't worth what it was, you don't go out and buy new stuff. The key point I want to make, and where we're getting at this, is housing is at the core of all of this. And that's not normal. You know, Each of the factors I've just laid out, consumer confidence, business confidence, profits up but not investment, all of those are important, but I'm going to argue that housing has been, in fact, more important than anything else. That during this great recession, which is very different than a normal kind of recession, housing was the immediate cause, both the bubble and the bursting of the bubble, and most importantly, preview of the final few slides, if you don't fix housing, you don't fix the economy. And that's the first time we've seen that for a long time. So. 
what are some of the things that mattered? Well, we had the ordinary recessions, ones that we've had in the past, usually begin with an inventory buildup. You know, we build up, a, we, we produce a lot of cars. I grew up in Detroit. I'm a Ford worker. I used to build planned obsolescence into Ford carburetors during the 1960s to put my way through school. Well, we'd build too many cars. They'd lay around on lots. We'd lay off workers. They wouldn't spend, and we'd have a recession until we drew that inventory of cars and toasters down, and then we'd have to rebuild them. We'd rehire workers, and that's what the normal business cycle would be. But this is an extraordinary cycle because it wasn't so much an inventory buildup of automobiles and all that. It was speculation in housing, particularly in states like Nevada, Arizona, Florida, California, followed by a you know, housing bubble in prices, followed by a collapse in housing prices, and then a financial meltdown because all kinds of financial institutions did some pretty silly things uh, with selling some paper that they shouldn't have sold. Okay? There's also the wealth effect, and that is the most important piece of asset that any of us are own, probably true in, for most of us in this room, if not all of us, is our homes. And it turns out there's a very significant wealth effect. Our friend Chip Case, Car Carl Case, at, uh, formerly of Wellesley, and uh, John Quigley and, and Bob Schiller have looked at this whole question of how much of our spending is tied to our wealth, right? You could have the same income year after year, but if your wealth is going up, you, you buy more. Well, what did they find? Since the middle of 2006, this is through the middle of this year, U.S. single-family home value has fallen by 6.3, again, trillion dollars. About a 28% loss in home value nationwide. Okay? They then found out, by doing very sophisticated statistical analysis, that every 1% decline in housing value generates, on average, a 0.08% decline in annual household consumption. Now, 0.08 may sound like a small number, but given that household consumption is 70% of gross domestic product, and gross domestic product is about $14 trillion, 0.08 of that is a 0.08 times 0.7, of 14 trillion is a lot of money. It produces a reduction of about 2.3% reduction in personal consumption. And if we translate that into what does that mean for nominal GDP growth, it means that if we had not had that reduction in home values, again, let me say it, if we had not had that reduction in home values, our GDP growth rate this year would have been about 5.4% nominal. That's before we control for inflation. 45% greater than it actually was. And if we convert it, according to my own calculations, to real GDP, we would have had a growth rate closer to 3% this year than the 1% to 1.5% we have this year. The difference between having an economy which continues to shed jobs versus an economy that's really recovering. So housing is at the very center of it. You may think you're just a real estate agent or whatever you do. The fact is you are at the very center center of the economy this time around. In the past, it might have been the auto industry or the steel industry or higher education or the medical industry. This time around, it's you guys. We don't fix housing. We don't recover. Okay? What has happened to home prices? This is from Freddie Mac. You may know about them. You'll look. I've circled some of the states where you've really seen values decline, right? 62% in Nevada, right? So you're a homeowner. You recently bought because you moved there to work in a casino. Your wealth has gone down by 62%. You're not buying anything, right? Or 46% in California, 50%, 53% in Arizona, 27% in Oregon. We've only had a decline of about 17% here, and that's why we're doing so much better than the rest of the country, second best to North Dakota. In fact, I just did an econometric analysis of this where I tried to compare the changes in home prices to the changes in economic activity. These statistics are not my own. I get them from somewhere else. I didn't make this up. You'll see this very strong positive relationship so that those states where their housing values fell the fastest and the soonest are the ones that have not recovered their economy. You'll see right down here, Nevada is almost off the map, way far in the southwest quadrant. Arizona, Florida, Idaho, Michigan. 
and then you'll see Massachusetts up there. North Dakota is that all the way up in the northeast uh, part of that quadrant. So there's a, a very close relationship, as that line tells you, between the loss in home value and where the economy is, and it operates through consumer sentiment, consumer wealth, and consumption. Okay? So how bad was the housing collapse? Between 2005 and 2011, new housing starts were down by 80%. Okay? Residential construction was down by 58%. So you can see here's the picture of what has happened in terms of starts, right? 420,000 starts is our estimate for all of 2011 compared with over 2 million starts in 2005, right? And if you look at it in terms of just investment dollars, down from about $775 billion, down to somewhere in the round $324 billion. And what that means is when you look at the components of GDP loss between 2008 and 2011, that three-year period, spring of 08 versus spring of this year, the latest data I had, you'll notice that overall GDP was down by a little bit, three-tenths of 1%. Actually, exports were up by 4.8%. Uh, of course, federal government expenditures were up because the federal government was, go was taking on tremendous debt. We had the ARRA program. We were expanding government programs. And so government spending was going up. What was personal consumption expenditures rose just 1%, almost anemic, but what fell? Well, 11% in non-residential production, but look at the decline in residential investment, 30%. That red bar is leading the economy. You make that recover or nothing works, okay? So, of course, housing construction affects everything else. When people build new homes, they also buy more appliances, they also buy more furniture, that means all those industries are affected. And you have to even work back from those industries. Because when you buy you know, a new stove, there's also steel and aluminum and other elements that go into that, taking that all the way back to mining of iron ore. It's such a big industry that when that industry fails, the fallout is all over the place. So let's just take a look at the near-term future, OK? Until quite recently, most economists were expecting 2011 to show us real recovery, continued of what we were seeing in 2010, right? And accelerating even faster in 2012. We're finally going to be out of this. But that doesn't seem to be the forecast anymore. The forecast seems to be that no longer is the government stimulating the economy. We'll probably have some massive deficit reduction, either because this deficit commission will come up with a plan or there'll be automatic cuts that will just slash both non-defense and defense spending. In any case, the kind of stimulus we had, which some Republicans say had no effect, but indeed kept us from going into the Great Depression, that's disappeared now. There's almost none of that left in Massachusetts, none of that stimulus left anywhere else. And the states themselves, as many of you know, and municipalities have had to tighten their belts, laying off people, making things even worse. So fiscal policy. President Obama is out today campaigning, I forget where, about his $447 billion jobs package um, of tax breaks and new government spending. It's very unlikely that the Congress will pass much of it, if any. Um, and in any case, and I'm a big supporter of Mr. Obama, um, many economists don't think that that package would do much good even if most of it were passed, at least not quickly. The infrastructure is very important. We need the roads. We need to fix all of this up. But it takes time to get it into the spending stream. We've given people payroll deductions on their taxes. It hasn't stimulated the economy because until you get consumer sentiment fixed, all they're going to do is save that, maybe pay off some credit card debt. And we could give businesses some job tax credits to have them hire people back. Uh, but it's unclear that any of that would work either, given business sentiment is so low, and business expectations about the economy, why hire even if the government's going to pay me 20% of that wage bill if I have to pay the other 80% and I don't have anything for that person to do? So the problem is, is we don't expect that that is A, going to pass in any case, and even if it did, it's not going to fix the real problem, which is housing. 
monetary policy, Ben Bernanke and the Fed. What they've done, of course, is they've vowed to keep interest rates as close to zero as possible. Mortgage rates are, until very recently, nationally just under 4%. They're still very low by historical standards. People aren't really taking advantage of them yet, right? And they're talking about a, a kind of current attempt by the Fed to do a twist on interest rates. So short-term interest rates might rise a little bit, but they're going to try and pull long-term interest rates down. Those are the ones that presumably business uses for investment, and we use for 15- and 30-year mortgage rates. But probably not going to have much of an, more impact. The problem is there's a big feedback loop. Feedback loop means when things are going well, they get better. But when things are going badly, they get worse. And we have a really bad feedback loop between the economy and uh, housing and the economy. Prospective home buyers are staying on the sidelines. Developers are cautious about building new units, although we're starting to see some new multifamily, mostly rental apartment units going up in Boston. Foreclosures may continue to remain high. They're actually higher than they were a year ago, not petitions, but deeds. The result is a feedback loop where one piece of bad economic news has a way of making everything else worse. We're still there. Four years after the Great Recession began. So what's to be done? One idea that, I have been, that I've been talking about for more than two years, I did a series of op-eds, and which happens to be in Banker and Tradesman this morning, is the idea that we need to somehow get people back into the home buying market and give them confidence that they can do that safely. You know, we give people insurance, uh, health insurance. Uh, we give them car insurance so they can go out and drive. We insure their home against fire and theft, right? What we need to do is actually insure the price of their homes. Now, that may sound crazy, but let me tell you how that would work. We create an 18-month federal program of home, in, home price insurance, which would basically be a catastrophic home insurance vehicle. What it would mean is if you bought a house and you sold it at a loss, the federal government will pick up 80% of it. You're still on the hook for 20%. You've got some skin in the game. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, the homeowner has to keep the home for at least three years before they can collect. So you can't sell the home. You can't just flip the home. Within three years, one suspects that home prices for most, in most markets will stabilize, right, even if nothing else happens. And so the cost of the government will probably be fairly small. If no one buys the insurance, there's no payout. If one to two million buy the insurance, as I think they would, prices will stabilize because we've got all kinds of additional demand that we wouldn't have otherwise. And there's a high risk to consumers if they don't take advantage of this program. They miss out on the insurance program option. It's only an 18 month, then it sunsets, right? And if they don't take advantage of it, and all their neighbors do, they miss out on the bottom of the market. So my guess would be is if we could put together this program, the administrative cost would be about five or $600, and we could offer it. In fact, Mar could offer this. Real estate agents could offer this insurance, federally backed. I think we would start to see people getting back into the market because their greatest fear, get in now, lose market value, be underwater for the rest of your life, is essentially not completely disappears, but most of it does. A second thing is we need to have foreclosure assistance. We should redouble our effort at mobilizing mortgage institutions and banks to refinance trouble loans, speed that up, make it more efficient, make it more effective than it has been. Uh, we may in the short term also want to do some Rio rental. Some of these housing units which are you know, beyond repair have to probably be smashed down by uh, our mayor. <coughs> Uh, some of them are in pretty good shape, and they should go through back on the market as home ownership. But some of these properties, um, we could probably figure out a way to rent them in the short term in order to keep them occupied, reduce the amount of copper mining, and so forth. And then finally, my grand conclusion is, you got to fix housing first. We have to rebuild home ownership opportunities, or the grand recession marches on and on and on. Thank you very much.
Am I on? Yeah. Dr. Bluson has answered some of the questions that I was seeding into the front of it, uh, responded to them. Uh, next, before we do a Q&A, uh, Dr. Belsky. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, pleasure to be with you. Uh, here, I was asked to speak a little bit about the uh, similar topic that uh, Barry was asked to speak about, which is where are we in terms of uh, the importance of housing to the economy. Uh, so I'm going to agree, obviously, with a lot of what Barry said, but try to provide some additional perspective. Before I do that, I just want to acknowledge Tom Gleason from Mass Housing, who's here, who's a good friend, and I think the state is very fortunate to have someone like him leading mass housing. It's a, really a premier housing finance agency across the country, and he's not only a, a, a leader here in Massachusetts, but really nationally, and we get to serve on advisory panels together, so uh, I've gotten to know him quite well. Um, clearly, housing is important to what's been going on in the economy, so I want to talk a little bit about why I think it's so important, and then talk a little bit also about how that may play out a little bit differently in Massachusetts. I think uh, it is clear that housing has a number of different impacts on the economy, and Barry indicated a number of them. One is through what we call residential fixed investment, which is basically home building and remodeling. And typically, the way the economy recovers is through a very strong spring back uh, in the home building side of residential fixed investment. In the state of Massachusetts, of course, home building, while it's significant, isn't as significant as it is in many other parts of the country. Other parts of the country is where the majority of home building takes place. So for those places like the Nevadas, the Arizonas, it's really going to be incredibly important to see home building come back for them to stage significant kinds of recoveries. Also, those are the places where you typically get the most building at the top of a cycle because they're having strong employment growth. Everybody thinks everything's humming. They continue to build in anticipation of greater and greater job growth. So it's really critical for that to turn around. In Massachusetts, Home building, as I say, recovery would be uh, meaningful and important to the economy. Through the uh, down cycle, uh, the state of Massachusetts lost tens of thousands of jobs in residential construction, uh, but it certainly isn't going to be so strong on the home building side. It will, however, be importantly on the remodeling side, and it will importantly be uh, as a result of a recovery in home prices. So the residential fixed investment, when you look at that, that uh, accounted for and shaved off about a percentage point of gross domestic products starting back in 2007 and rolling through 2008, 2009, uh, had a very minimal uh, impact either way in 2010 into 2011, a slight net negative, but not that dramatically negative. But the housing wealth effect has really been the larger effect. This effect that I've also studied and come up with a similar estimate, which is for about every dollar of housing wealth that gets lost, uh, people spend somewhere between six and seven cents less per dollar, which is a significant amount of money. And we all know this. Uh, when you start feeling like the value of your home's falling, what do you do? You spend less. Uh, and save more. And that's been what's happening nationally, and we've seen a rebound in the savings rate uh, as a result of people's leeriness to go out and spend. So this housing wealth effect has been estimated to have shaved off, when you compare it to that one percentage point of GDP growth, closer to two percentage points of GDP growth. And that's been going on since 2008, 2009. 2010 was also a bad year, not as bad. 2011 is also shaping up to be a drag as a result of the housing wealth effect. So it really comes down to <clears throat> how do you get uh, house prices to come back? Uh, how do you get existing home sales to come back? Because when you look at the other part that I think is very material in Massachusetts, the remodeling, the home improvement effect, it comes back strongly only when existing home sales rebound strongly. The amount that people spend on their homes when they move in uh, is probably no surprise to the realtors in the room. It goes up dramatically um, because that's when you first move in, you figure, well, I might as well benefit from my own home improvement rather than halfway through and you think, well, maybe I'm leaving the home. So people will spend several thousand dollars more on average <clears throat> than the typical homeowner. So you need to get these existing home sales to come back for two reasons. One is you need it to generate that remodeling spending effect, but you also need it to get housing prices to turn around and start to move up. So why aren't we getting it is the obvious question. Un, uh, unlike what's happening nationally, as we know, which is an extremely anemic 
uh, employment recovery. Here we may only be a little bit over the high water mark that we had reached at the peak of 2006, but our job growth has actually been 1.8% year over year, August over August. It's actually the strongest job growth. So we're starting to see jobs come back. So the question is, do you need housing to see jobs come back? No, there are other sectors of the economy that can come back. Do you need it to sustain that job growth? Yes. Do you need it to have a more robust recovery? Absolutely, because you need people to spend more. On the construction side, it would be nice to see more construction uh, because for every single-family home that's built, you get about 3.2 jobs uh, in that year, uh, you know, sort of full-time equivalent jobs locally. Uh, and for every multifamily unit, about 2.1 jobs. So those do create jobs, uh, but you need to get this broader recovery so that people are spending more, and that uh, shores up the service economy, uh, the retail economy, goods producing um, sectors in the state. So all these things are necessary. And so again, you ask yourself the question, you know, what is going on here? Why don't we have this? And you have to... It, especially ask yourself the question, why aren't we getting this when we have 4% uh, interest rates? Uh, this is an unbelievably uh, uh, great time to buy as a result of low interest rates. So you would think that there'd be takers out there. So the question is, why aren't there takers out there? Well, there's a couple of things that are, are clearly going on. One is, it's not clear that people realize that uh, even if prices were to drift a little lower, uh, the impact of a 1% increase in interest rates at this point would be tantamount to like a 12 to 15% jump in house prices in terms of their monthly payment. So they're, on one level, kind of looking at what's going on with prices, and there's the classic expression, no one wants to catch a falling knife. Uh, and so they see a deflationary environment. This is why, by the way, uh, Hank Paulson, who was the Secretary of the Treasury at the time, went on bended knee to the Speaker of the House, who was Nancy Pelosi at the time, something that I think he thought was a, a pretty unpalatable thing to have to do and begged for a trillion dollar blank check because he was afraid of deflation in the broader economy. That's what we have in housing markets. So part of it is what Barry said. It's this consumer confidence. You know, I think prices may fall further. Why would I buy if I think prices are going to fall further? Uh, and then there's the interest rate side. And I think the interesting perverse effect of, of some of the things that the Federal Reserve uh, is currently doing, this uh, twist program, which I think you mentioned, which is an attempt to lower long-term rates even more, is that normally when interest rates uh, reach this kind of level, people think, wow, this is not going to last forever. And they see it as a time to move into the market. But now you have this sense that somehow uh, they're going to drag those things down even a little more. So what I'm telling you is there's no urgency in the market. So the question is, is there a will? And I think the will has been significantly impacted by the fact that prices continue to fall, and I'll get back to why that's happening in a second. It's also uh, significantly affected by the fact that there's a sense that maybe as low as interest rates are, there's not much urgency. Now, interest rates moved up a little bit, as you all know, and it looks like purchase applications in the last few weeks actually went up. And there's always this um, tendency when interest rates go up for some people to think, well, maybe this is my moment to get in. Um, so you have still a sort of se a lack of sense of urgency in the market. Uh, but beyond that, even if you have the will, the way is, as you know, much more difficult than the way is getting a mortgage loan. And it's been really, really become much, much harder for people to get a loan. And the perception of how difficult it is has increased. And so in this environment, um, you get less applications almost certainly than you would otherwise get because people... This may come as a shock to you, fear rejection in life. And so they don't like to go into a lender sort of thinking or knowing that they're going to be told no. And in fact, one of the reasons there was such a surge in lending to borrowers who didn't do any comparison shopping during the boom and got into all sorts of products that were not very healthy for them is that someone told them yes. And the slogans for those lenders were things like when someone else says no, we say yes. You know, you have no, no, no salary, uh, your credit rating's ruined, we say yes, come on in. And literally, you would hear, you've heard them on the radio. You don't hear them so much anymore, uh, but you heard those kinds of things. So people wanted to get it. Now it's the opposite. It's the fear that they're not going to get it. And it's not just the fear, it's the reality. So when you look at what's going on and the role the federal government is playing here, uh, you may not have noticed this, uh, but, you know, uh, over a weekend in September, the federal government basically nationalized the mortgage market by taking over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and standing behind their debt. 
and standing behind their mortgage-backed securities, not their equity, but standing behind those debts in the mortgage-backed securities market. So they now are very fundamental to what underwriting standards are uh, available, unless you're in the jumbo market, which is now, uh, as a result of changes in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the loan limits, uh, become a slightly larger market. But the mass middle market is really governed by what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are willing uh, to do. And their credit standards have tightened just really dramatically. As an example, if you went back to 2006 and you defined a category of loans as, as good loans, and I think you'd all call these good loans, you had an over 720 credit score, you had a 75% or less loan to value ratio, which means you had more than 25% equity in front of you, uh, and you had, um, I'm trying to remember the other part of this, so you had yeah, a, a significant down payment, and you had um, a strong uh, credit score. And that was something like 2% of the market in 2006. And by the way, Fannie and Freddie weren't the, the most liberal lenders back in 2006. They were 2% of the market. You couldn't even see it if it was on a stacked bar chart. Uh, now it's something like 85 to 90% of the loans that they're doing. So you have to have really strong credit in order to qualify, which means that, and, and not just strong credit, but you have to have a very significant down down payment, uh, which means that if you're like most typical first-time buyers, which is what's going to take to fuel the market because so many others are underwater and that's going to hold back the trade-up market, if you're going to get a first meaningful first-time buyer recovery, these people have to be able to get loans. So where are they going to get these loans? They certainly don't have the wealth to put down 10% or more, which is what mostly Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans look like uh, they require without significant uh, price and fee increases on the on the loan. So they're going to FHA, and FHA is also where they're going because FHA is just a better execution in terms of the, the, the uh, cost to the borrower. Uh, and there you can get a, a low down payment loan, but even FHA is tightened, so you know that they they uh, increase the down payment slightly to 3.5% as the, as the uh, minimum down payment, but they also put in a credit score grid. And that in and of itself should not be so chilling on the ability of people to get credit. Uh, but what banks who are the originators of those loans are doing is they're applying their own uh, greater overlays and screens. So you might say, why is that? If FHA is willing to get these, why are they applying uh, tighter screens than FHA itself requires? Well, there's a whole series of reasons. One is that lending in general has just become much riskier than people anticipated it to be. And not just because of home price declines, but because of the amount of litigation that's uh, now going on. Uh, against all the major lenders, originators, servicers. And there seems to be, to them, almost no end to that. They're not sure where it's going to end or how it's going to end. They're trying to reach settlements with state attorneys, generals, uh, and then Fannie and Freddie aren't part of the settlement. They're technically FHFA isn't part of the settlement. They're, they're, they're regulator. So you have all these things going on, and they're, they're leery. So I've heard lenders say to me that they don't view 100, FHA as 100% guarantee anymore because they don't know what liability is out there. They don't know what a next administration or, uh, or commissioner may do in terms of, uh, uh, of, of um, agreeing to pay claims and honoring claims that they're supposed to pay. So all of this thing makes FHA, even to lenders, even though it's a 100% insurance program, seem less like that to them. Uh, and in addition, they are subjected to a test on a regular basis, which is called a compare ratio, where they're compared to their peers uh, in terms of the delinquency rates which your FHA loans are performing. And so there's a race. I guess we had a race to the lowest common denominator during the boom. We now have a race to the highest common denominator, which is a level of tightness and underwriting that most people in the business and the industry, including the lenders who are, I think, moving to that, uh, highest common den denominator underwriting really feel is necessary given where we are in the market, which is obviously after a very significant price corrections on the order of 35% nationally and much more in other markets. Uh, and they have, a, a, a by law, are charging an insurance premium that is intended to be uh, sufficient to cover the cost of the program, and in fact has been through the entire life of the program, even in the middle of this uh, terrible meltdown. So it's really going to be important to get people back to the market to be able to qualify uh, more people and to address those uh, sorts of issues. Very significant. 
If you ask the people actually fundamentally still want to become homeowners, the good news is every survey, and there's many of them, Fannie Mae has them, Hanley Wood just did a survey, uh, Trulia.com does a survey, I'm missing probably four or five others. It's become very popular to do these, these surveys. And what they basically show is an uh, overwhelming majority of people want to uh, own a home. They think that owning, quote unquote, makes more financial sense than renting. This includes renters. Um, and owners. And in, in, in the case of renters, it's about three quarters of them uh, reach that conclusion. In the case of owners, it's even a slightly uh, higher proportion. So I often say in talks like this that the jury is in on this subject. People want home ownership, even in the face of what they see are very significant risks uh, to home ownership. And they also, when you ask uh, people under 35, is now a good time to buy? Renters, now a good time to buy? You know, more than half of them, in the case of people under 35, something like two-thirds of them say, yeah, they think it's a good time to buy, yet they're not out there buying. And part of it is this, you know, concern, is this the best time to buy? Right time to buy is not the same as best time to buy. And then if they do, can they get into the market? And there's still, uh, you know, every time there's a surge in potential confidence, it gets dragged down. I, I hate to pick up the paper in the morning, you know, these days, because it's something, you know. It's it's a it's a, it's a nuclear accident in Japan. It's uh, the European debt markets are are, and that's like a recurring nightmare. The European debt markets are a problem, and then it sort of goes away. Oh, the recurring the European debt markets are a problem. Oh, yeah, it's a recurring, you know. And so uh, some of these things just keep going on and on and on. These things are going to have to turn around to see a meaningful uh, housing recovery. And we need these kinds of things to be able to get back to uh, a, a supply and demand balance that allows prices to move back up in the state of Massachusetts. But what's actually been happening, and we only have numbers on this from the second quarter, through the second quarter of this year, um, you know, so through the end of June, but if you look at the second quarter of 2010 to the second quarter of 2011, according to the uh, Housing Vacancy Survey, which has a lot of imperfections but should be showing trend reasonably well, uh, shows an increase of a homeowner vacancy rate, vacant and for sale uh, properties out there, going from 1% in Massachusetts, which was a low number relative to the rest of the, to the country, to 2%, which is pretty much in line with the rest of the country. So there's, over the course of the year, a lot more homes are showing up on the market is vacant. And you know what that means. It means that the prices are going to be under pressure moving forward. So what really has the federal government ultimately been doing in all of this? Well, if they hadn't stepped in to uh, take Fannie and Freddie into conservatorship, there's a pretty strong chance that what was, uh, what I always like to say, if you think the economy went to Hell, the handbasket would have followed if you woke up one morning and couldn't get a mortgage to do anything. No one could buy or sell a property or refinance a loan. And the nation was sort of facing that prospect when Fannie and Freddie were taken into conservatorship. And not only that, just to take out an extra marker of insurance, the Federal Reserve started buying their mortgage-backed securities to keep uh, interest rates on those at uh, reasonable levels. Um, we would have had an unbelievably ugly global meltdown that would have made this one look actually small in comparison, and I don't even actually want to think about what it would have looked like. That was the single most important thing they've done. The other is the Federal Reserve uh, just, you know, easing of monetary policy. So the problem with what the federal government's doing that really matters is it's, it, it, they've already sort of done it. And the market hasn't come back. And so now they're trying to do other things. They continue to do the HAMP modifications, which are, you know, substantial uh, cost sharing between the federal government and a lender to get people to be able to stay in their homes, as you probably all know. The other one is the Homes Affordable Refinance Program, HARP, which sounds better than HAMP, and I hear music when I hear it. Uh, but that has actually not been nearly as successful as they wanted it to be. It was supposed to be for underwater homeowners, and as, as Barry noted, uh, there's discussion about trying to expand that program and to have Fannie and Freddie, uh, which really run those programs, uh, uh, do things that would increase the take up of that program. But to date, they were hoping to get about 4 million homeowners to refinance through that program. They've gotten under a million. And of that, the overwhelming majority are not the program was designed to go up to 125% of LTV, which, by the way, there's something like 8 million homeowners that are in that you know, sort of camp there. Um, but they uh, are almost all at 105% or loan-to-value ratio or less, and people are spending more than the interest rates that you're seeing in the paper because they're being charged fees or, quote-unquote, loan-level price adjustments for them. So they may uh, eventually do that. The reasons you may ask is what's the holdup if Treasury wants to do it? 
the White House wants to do it, HUD wants to do it. It's that the one that really has to make this decision is the Federal Housing Finance Agency, and they have yet to uh, make significant uh, program changes, although even they're signaling they'll, they'll do something. And that would be helpful, obviously, because it'll help the economy recover, it'll help people spend. But what we really got to get is more households forming to absorb all these housing units uh, that are out there on the market. And a lot of the other things the federal government's doing uh, either were short-lived and really didn't do much except juice the market for a period of time, like the first-time buyer tax credit, and I'll end on that, um, and the, uh, and the na- neighborhood stabilization program, which Tom knows is literally a drop in, in an ocean of need uh, to deal with the most uh, distressed communities from foreclosures. The reason I want to end on, the, on that last note, which is the first-time uh, uh, buyer tax credit, how many of you remember the first-time buyer credit of last year. Come on, show your hands. You've been sitting for all this time. You all remember, did you like that period of time? It felt good to actually see people buy and sell homes. You know, I had a family member who bought a home in that period, and I was talking to his realtor about it, and the realtor basically said, I've never seen such insanity in my entire career. And they had lived through the multiple bidding wars in 05 and 06. People were desperate Buyers wanted to close by this date. Sellers wanted to sell by that date. Everybody was on that bandwagon. And what's interesting about this, and the reason I want to end with this, and I'll end with, a, with, a, with a, another quote from Chip Case, who's, who's a good friend of mine. Um, you know, when that happened, think about what it really was, okay? For a first-time buyer, it was up to $8,000 or 10% of the purchase price. And when you think about that, you know, most people buy a home that's more than $80,000, okay? Even in the middle of this crazy downturn, is more than $80,000. So they were getting something that was tantamount to 2 or 3% of the home purchase price. And it came in a different way. It came as an offer of something that you would miss out on and as cash. And that was enough to get people, and there was, a, remember our first one, In 2009, in the spring of 2009, you couldn't imagine a worse time for people to think about buying. In the newspaper, they were telling us that that we were losing jobs, 800,000, a million a month nationally. I mean, that is like, you know, that should have you from the fear to panic mode. Uh, The stock market had gone from 1,500 to, what was it, 800 or 600? I can't remember, 15,000, if you did did the Dow as opposed to the S&P. 15,000 down to like 8,000, 7,000, 6,000. And there was a surge in buying even then uh, because interest rates were low, prices had fallen, and you gave someone something framed that way. Fast forward to 2010, where it really looked like things were starting to get better for the economy. We're starting to see employment growth, a better tax credit. And you saw people really come out. Prices firmed very quickly. You noticed all these things. And the problem with it was, as soon as it was over, everyone that got excited about it had bought. And then you got this big trough. So now we have these year-over-year gains, which are sort of illusory because year-to-date, Massachusetts is still down about 10% in sales. House prices, depending on who you talk to, are either flat uh, or still falling a little bit in the state of Massachusetts. These va- homeowner vacancy rates are going up. Yet people came out. So what that tells me is that there is an incredible appetite for home ownership. And people are looking for the reason and the excuse to get out there. And this is where we're going to end with Chip Case's quote. Uh, He's fond of saying that the problem with calling a housing recovery, I used to say, uh, you know, uh, housing is the canary in the coal mine going into a recession, you know, because it's the first thing to gas for oxygen, and it's dead before the miners can do anything about it, and the miners are kind of like the material suppliers to them, and then the distributors see the miners running out gasping for air, and, you know, um, and... I called it the Poxitani fill of a recovery, which is not all that exciting a way to to characterize. And also, it's very hard to spell Poxitani. Uh, But what Chip Case would say is that uh, the problem with recoveries, it's like when they happen, it's like someone blew a whistle that only dogs and home buyers can hear. (laughs) And so we're all waiting for the whistle. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Belsky. This all goes back to uh, the title of the session, the relationship between home ownership, jobs, and economic growth. You've heard twice now that home ownership is the engine that's going to drive it. Uh, it's interesting, uh, um, 
when uh, Dr. Bluestone talked about housing being the, the thing that dragged down the economy, and I would suggest to you that uh, it was the separation of the money from the house or securitization that was the drag. When you went into your local banker and said, I need a mortgage, the banker knew you, the banker knew the house. When you had a problem, the banker didn't want the house back, they worked with you. When you have uh, a security of a thousand uh, mortgages owned by somebody in Spain and you're in trouble, there's no one to talk to. And I think that may be an issue that we have to talk about. But more, and, and what Dr. Belsky said at, at the very end, is that people want to buy a house. Home ownership is valuable to them, and yet they're not doing it. And I think one of the questions is that uh, while the economy is, is seeing housing as a victim, uh, seeing it as, as not as a victim, as, as the cause, it is in fact the victim of the economy of bringing it down. It isn't the cause of bringing it down. And so how do you change the mindset of our legislators, our bankers, to try to get housing back into um, being the positive, to being the engine, to being something that's, that's a positive thing for the, for the nation to, uh, uh, to embrace. And I'll throw that out to the two of you first and then to the floor. Very quick thing. I, I agree with you. Um, housing is viewed as the you know, uh, central problem that dragged the economy into a recession. And so that's part of the problem. I was in a meeting with Larry Summers in which you know, he described housing as sort of having the mother of all credibility problems. But it's really the, the uh, financial institutions that uh, are, in many respects, the more significant contributor. So when you look at what happened leading up to the housing uh, troubles, uh, really what it was was a situation where you had incredible amounts of liquidity. And every time in history that you have that amount of global liquidity, it tends to try to find a way to deploy, to invest. And as people try to invest, um, what they find is that the amount of capital they created, say, over a boom period like the 1990s, which was caused by industrialization in China and India and Brazil all taking off, really they were investing in things that generated real returns, built real things. But eventually it causes debt to become very inexpensive to try to deploy, and you get an asset bubble. And it wasn't just an asset bubble in housing, okay? It was an asset bubble in the stock market. It was an asset bubble everywhere. It wasn't just homeowners that got ever over leveraged. Even more dramatically, it was financial institutions. There was deregulation that took place in 1998, allowed them to have a, uh, set their own um, investment banks, set their own leverage ratios, and they went up from, you know, like 15 to 1 to 30, 35 to 1. So you have a bunch of over leveraged financial institutions, over leveraged households, and the governor on all of this should have been, you know, the lending community and the investor community that realized that by relaxing underwriting standards in those ways that we're going to get into serious, serious problems. And it was a problem that was really bad in the housing market um, because the housing market started very tight when all this started happening. Prices started going up. People started buying an expectation of prices going up. But I think part of it is understanding that housing, as you said, was really part of a much broader phenomenon that we've seen time and time again, and it has to do with the way that the investment in the lender community uh, was treating those assets that they had. And until we get to that point, and housing is still viewed in this negative light, it's hard to get policymakers to step in. And then, of course, there's the other narrative, and I'll turn it to Barry, the other narrative is the home ownership uh, that uh, uh, the regulations that promoted home ownership for low-income people are the problem. Uh, and it's very hard to sustain that because, of course, the largest losses and the biggest problems were not derived from that slice of the market. They were much broader, and they affected much more people, and they were geographically concentrated as a result of overbuilding. So I think there's a couple of things that have to happen before uh, the politics are going to improve. And people just basically saying, yeah, and I think these surveys are good. I want to buy a home. And, you know, NEHB has a survey that shows that people are supportive of the mortgage interest deduction, uh, whether or not they themselves are taking it. So I think those kinds of things start to get the attention of political leaders that, you know, this is something that people want, and we have to get back to understanding that we have to look, drive in the front view towards, you know, we're at the bottom of a market potentially or very close, 
uh, and let's drive forward out of it, and home ownership could be an important part of that, to seeing it as something that has got all these you know, baggages. Barry. Well, I, I would add by saying that one way you start doing this is you have more forums like this, where you really begin to tell people you know, how important housing is in going forward toward a recovery. You know, our problem, and I don't know if it's just the US, but we have these tendencies to just kind of overreact to crises. So indeed, we had a housing bubble. Indeed, we did some very dumb things with subprime mortgages and alt A's and other kinds of instruments that made no sense. The banks made some, and financial institutions made some very, very terrible choices of taking on risk they should never have. Some of that was a reaction to deregulation because we thought government was the problem. And now what happens is that we overreact just the way Eric was suggesting. We now make it too difficult for people to get credit when, in fact, credit-worthy people who are not going to default who have a very, very low probability of foreclosure uh, are having trouble getting mortgage money. That doesn't make sense. We have to tell that story. There's something else that I, uh, I, I probably should hold this for October 25th. But in the Greater Boston Housing Report Card, I've actually devoted an entire chapter to home ownership. We've never done that in eight years, uh, to talk about home ownership itself as a, you know, an important attribute of American society. And part of it, of course, is because home ownership is such an important asset, and relative to renters, you get much more consumption than you do for people who have exactly the same incomes. Somebody who owns a home versus a renter with the same income, you get more consumption out of it because of the wealth effect. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that, that is important, and people haven't woken up to this, is that for all intents and purposes, we have gotten to a point in America where most white families own their own homes, about 70% plus. We have gotten to the point where we're starting to see increases, significant increases in the percentage of African American families, Hispanic families, Asian families who are finally being able to get a piece of the rock. And just when we've done that, we're now pulling the rug out from underneath them. And what's interesting, when I went into the numbers and I looked at home ownership rates, it turns out that of the top 100 metro areas in the United States, the greater Boston area has a relatively low home ownership rate. It's actually rural communities that have the, the highest. I think West Virginia has the highest home ownership rate in the country. But we are 19th overall from the bottom. That is, there are 81 metro areas that have higher home ownership rates than we do. But if you look at African Americans, we're the fourth lowest home ownership rate out of the top 100. And the same for Hispanics. The Asians doing a little bit better. So that in fact, there's also the question of whether we're going to have not just uh, get back to a point where home ownership is something that people uh, can, can get into that market but whether we're going to continue our commitment to making sure that all families, regardless of their race, regardless of their ethnicity, have a shot at home ownership. And I think that's going to be, I hope that will be part of what some politicians will be talking about. And it is, it is very significantly for that group an underwriting issue because uh, they, you know, they have much lower wealth. They have parents who don't have wealth, so they can't help them with a down payment. So unless we have, you know, um, an ability for people to put small down payments down on a home, and they also have, on average, lower credit scores, it's going to be challenging to do that. And that is a very, very uh, significant issue. When you look at the gaps in wealth between whites and minorities, they're much more dramatic than the gaps in income, which are dramatic. Exactly. Um, and they're baked in, and they keep getting worse and worse and worse. And when you look at which communities were most affected by the downturn, it was um, African-American and Hispanic communities, and they've taken a much larger hit to their wealth uh, than, than uh, whites have. So this is a very significant issue moving forward. Of course, this is the country is becoming increasingly diverse and is increasingly going to be the country. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a critical issue. Uh, I found there's one with boots on the ground, and I'll have my uh, compatriots uh, confirm that when you have uh, um, non-typical uh, Americans, uh, when you have minorities and, and people from foreign cultures, the first thing they want to do is own a home. And they'll gather their families together and gather the wealth together, and a lot of them uh, were, were sucked into 
the uh, uh, home ownership that they couldn't afford because they weren't educated and that you had the unregulated mortgage originators who was t giving them a song and dance and they lost their homes. But I find even today when I have someone who is Asian or Russian or, or uh, Spanish, Hispanic, uh, the, the desire for home ownership is incredible mm -hmm. and the power behind it is incredible. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Anybody have questions and comments on the positioning of home ownership in this country, how it's being dealt with and what, it ought, what ought to happen? Questions for uh, uh, Dr. Belstein or Dr. Bluestone? Yes, sir. Uh, just a quick question. Um, all this information is great, and, and there's many aspects of, of what's impacting the recovery. I'm a housing counselor, and there are two issues that I see with our home buyers. Uh, number one, they realize that there's a lot more risk about getting into home ownership. There's, there's a lot more responsibility financially, and so they're trying to save more. And so that takes them longer uh, to get ready for home ownership. And the second thing is that they're concerned about wages. That you know, if they don't have the income coming in, they're concerned about what they can afford in the long term. And so they're smarter, and I and and I commend them for that. But I haven't really seen the sense of how the jobs impact sentiment. I think that people are concerned about losing their job. And so while they they may be ready for home ownership now, they don't want to put themselves in that situation where they can lose their job and lose their home. On the foreclosure side, most of the families that we're seeing are coming in because of loss of income and job loss. And so as that continues, we're going to see more homes hitting the market, you know, and, and this cycle is just going to continue. So I, I feel personally that the primary issue is how do we recover on the job side? I mean, we got through the wave of the subprime back in 08. And since then, we've been seeing a lot of families who've been impacted by the job economy. And so how... How can we fix the job issue? I think it's, uh, it's the main concern. How do we fix the job issue so that families feel more confident that they can go ahead and, and, make, and take that step of that financial responsibility that comes with home ownership? That's the $64,000 question that you nailed it just right. I mean, part of our problem, not part of our problem, the major problem we have in this country now is a political problem. We have uh, a Congress which is totally dysfunctional. We have a Congress that is more interested, at least part of the Congress, in defeating President Obama in 2012 than doing anything for the economy. And the result is, is that we're getting nothing out of Washington that we absolutely need. We actually need a very large stimulus package right now in order to be able to produce jobs. Part of the reason why I've been supporting this idea of the home price insurance plan, as opposed to the first time home buyer credit, which is a very expensive program and probably 70 to 80 percent of those homes would have been bought anyway, is this costs almost nothing, the home insurance plan. And so I'm trying to figure out ways of stimulate, stimulating the economy on the cheap, as I said in a Boston Globe editorial op-ed a while ago. But that we can't even get a $447 billion program through, right, is, is what a serious problem we have. I had suggested in the New York Times op-ed the day before Obama's jobs package that there would be four steps that the government could take to really stimulate the economy. Very quickly, the first was the President of the United States sits down with the presidents of all the public unions in the country and asks them to accept a two-year wage freeze tied to a no-layoff clause. We're laying off public employees, teachers, firefighters, police officers. We've got to stop that. Number two, based on that commitment of no increase in wages or compensation, but also no layoffs, the Congress would come up with a $100 billion immediate uh, revenue sharing to go to the states and municipal governments in order to maintain their budgets, in order to be able to maintain their employment or expand their employment. The third, we've got $1.8 trillion worth of profit sitting doing nothing a temporary 5.5% profits tax for two years on corporations with more than a million dollars worth of profit to pay for that $100 billion, right? And the fourth, implement the home price insurance program. That's the kind of innovative thinking we need, and we need people getting up, whether they're occupying Wall Street or they're occupying New Bedford or they're in this room, and starting to talk with the people, including lieutenant governors and congresspeople and senators and the president himself, we need action now. We need to do everything we can to create jobs. And in fact, part of the answer, a large part of the answer, 
is making sure that we restabilize home prices and we make it possible for people to buy those homes. They want to buy them with the jobs, some home price insurance, we can get them back in the market. And that will stimulate the economy and we'll get back to that feedback loop as a positive feedback loop, things getting better, making things even better, rather than the vicious cycle that we're in now. No, that's exactly it. It's, it's jobs to try to get us out of a downward spiral and into an upward spiral. As I said, you know, uh, Massachusetts had reasonably good job growth, but nationally we got 1.8 million jobs since the uh, job growth turned positive. That's not even enough to keep up with the growth of the labor force. Uh, we still have an over 9% unemployment rate. It's going to be really difficult to get people to feel comfortable about their jobs in that environment. And also, to the point that the council was making, uh, when we talk about what's going on with unemployment rates, and so, you know, Massachusetts seeing some job growth, but among, uh, you know, people in their uh, 20s, the unemployment rate is dramatically higher, and you do need to get the consumer to begin consuming more, because a lot of the jobs they're going to get are going to be in the retail sector, and those are the jobs that need to come back and just haven't come back as strongly because the consumer spending just hasn't justified people going out and hiring for those purposes. So it's a, it's a, it's a big, jobs are a big issue. And that's why jobs are still kind of number one is what people ought to be focused on. But you're absolutely right that the one prediction I can make for you that I'm confident about is that Washington's going to remain dysfunctional for at least another year and probably beyond that. And that is, that's a major problem when you're in this kind of, the economy went from looking like it was recovering to teetering, and if you don't want it to fall back, you would want to take out insurance against it, whether it's house rights insurance or it's job creation insurance, but it's just not going to happen. Well, uh, thank you for explaining to me why I feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. Just two quick questions from uh, Mr. Bluestone. Since the discussion turned to Washington, you said maybe government can help, and that you are a big fan of uh, President Obama. Well, I guess uh, President Obama couldn't make it this morning, but I would ask him these two questions. Why did he want to eliminate the, uh, the exemption tax last year for a million dollars when you passed the states down? And also, why is the president against, uh, he wants to eliminate the interest uh, that we deduct for, for home ownership? How could that possibly help ownership in the future for what we're discussing today? Thank you. Well, to the extent that he is supporting eliminating the mortgage interest deduction, I disagree with him. I think there are things that we could do to improve it. Um, I had an interesting thing, if I could just tell a quick story. I was invited down to a National Association of, Retail, uh, of Realtors convention in, in San Juan, Puerto Rico at the Ritz Hotel. And um, I didn't realize that after my speech, which was similar to what I just gave you, uh, although without some of these data that are newer, that the next speaker was um, Trent Lott, the former senator, congressman and senator from Mississippi, very conservative Republican. And uh, after I talked about the mortgage interest deduction and why I thought it was important to maintain it, but maybe change it in a few ways, he got up and he said the following. I want to thank the folks from here in the National Association of, Re of, of Realtors because I just figured out my 2010 income tax, and because of your great effort at keeping the mortgage interest deduction, I saved $17,800 on my summer home. And I think what people are worried about is that you have multi, multi-millionaires who can take advantage of this a lot more than people who buy a home for $300,000. There is the possibility we could turn the mortgage introduction into a credit for those people, we might want to eliminate on our third, fourth, or fifth homes. We might want to cap it at some, you know, one and a half million bucks. But getting rid of it would be a terrible, bad mistake. And why would you want to get rid of it after white folks have been able to take advantage of it, but very few people of color? So that would be the argument I would make. I think what we have to do is convince this president. I'm a great supporter. I don't think he has been the president I hoped he would be. We can talk about that off camera. But um, I think what's important is that we now use this time to reimagine a discussion about where America should be. And a large part of that is going to be going back to what I think some of our, our basic you know, beliefs about what makes a good society. And as David has pointed out, 
home ownership is central to that. It gives you a piece of a rock, piece of the rock. It gives you an opportunity to invest in your children's education. It gives you a chance to use some of that equity to start a business. And we also know from work we will report in the Greater Boston Housing Report Card that it does very good things for the community. Even after you control for length of ownership or rental, we find very positive relationships between home ownership and civic engagement and voting and being involved in your community. And we all know that. And we have to go back to those bedrock issues rather than the cover of Time magazine. We've run at the out of time on this session. It's time for our uh, go to lunch. And the sessions this afternoon, I think, will pick up on what we just discussed here and in the previous uh, session. So thank you for your time and your participation. Thank you.